2022 marks 200 years since Jean-Francois Champollion famously cracked the code. He deciphered ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. Now, to mark this huge anniversary, the British Museum have opened a new exhibition, taking you through the story of this significant breakthrough. And today, I received special access to come and have a look at it. Earlier this year, I visited Egypt to see some of its most stunning ancient sites up close. Looking at individual hieroglyphs, and the amazing information they have revealed about this land's distant past. Ever since, I've been keen to learn more about how these symbols were deciphered. It's an incredible story that the British Museum tells in their newest exhibition. From ancient papyri to medieval Arab manuscripts, the exhibition is filled with wonderful objects that each have their own story to tell. And right at its heart, is one of the world's most famous artefacts, the Rosetta Stone, the great keystone of it all. Curator Dr. Ilona Rigorski is going to tell me more. Ilona, first off, it's absolutely wonderful to be here and to see such an incredible object so, well, up close in your new exhibition. But first off, we've all heard the name Rosetta Stone, but what exactly is it? The Rosetta Stone is a stela that was uh, probably set up in a temple the text inscribed on it is a priestly decree that was issued in, uh, on, the on the 27th of March, 196 BC, by a council of priests who come together in the city of Memphis. And the king, Ptolemy V, comes to Memphis uh, to join the priests on this occasion. Ptolemy V was a Greco-Macedonian king who ruled Egypt between 204 and 180 BC. Although his reign would be plagued by conflict, both inside and outside of Egypt, his subjects honoured him as the beneficent. It tells us basically in three different scripts, two languages, that the king should be treated as a god because he did so many good deeds for the country. And the end of every uh, text of, every, of, the ver of each version tells us that it had to be carved in hard stone which apparently happened, um, and it had to be set up in all the important temples of Egypt. And so, Alona, we've got these three different texts here. What languages are these? At the bottom, we have ancient Greek, which uh, is a language that was known at the time of discovery in 1799. And so that's why um, the hope immediately rose that uh, perhaps this could be used to decipher the two Egyptian uh, scripts. In the middle, we have Demotic, which was the, the language and the script of the time, the daily language. And at the top, we have hieroglyphs, which is basically reflecting the same language as the Demotic. The early 2nd century BC was an extraordinary time in Egypt's long and fascinating ancient history. This was when Egypt was ruled by the so-called Ptolemaic dynasty, Greco-Macedonian rulers who reigned over this land in the wake of Alexander the Great's death. Ruling from the rich and vibrant city of Alexandria, the Ptolemies reigned over a land where both Greek and Egyptian was spoken all along the River Nile. During the 2nd century BC, Egypt was very much a multi cultural and a bilingual country, so those who could read and write would probably have been able so to do so in, in Egyptian and in Greek. And especially the uh, officials who were working in the centralized administration, they would probably have worked in Greek, but could have been speaking Egyptian at home. So we have this very inter interesting interaction between these languages. We think that the text probably originally is a Greek text because to honor the pharaoh as a god was, is not something very Egyptian. We don't find this kind of decree in earlier periods. So we think that the, the type of text was imported from Greece and then translated into the two Egyptian language to give it a local veneer, if you want. This is a good example of Hellenistic ruler cult coming to Ptolemaic Egypt. Egypt, isn't it? Yes, yeah. The wording of the Rosetta Stone gives us an invaluable insight into how the Ptolemies ruled Egypt. But another great part of this object's story is how it was found. So how was this stone discovered? 
The stone was discovered in the foundations of a building, of a fort, in uh, present-day Rashid, uh, a city that the French called Rosette, Little Rose. And it was reused as a building block, um, in a way. We don't know when this happened, um, so the original place where the stone would have been set up is unknown to us. We, we, have, we can make suggestions, but it was really Rashid, present-day Rashid, where the stone was found. And immediately upon discovery, it was realized that this could potentially be the key to decipherment. So it was immediately um, assumed that the stone was an important uh, object. The stone was initially discovered by the French, but following the defeat of Napoleon's expedition to Egypt, it was handed over to the British as part of the capitulation of Alexandria. Transported to Britain by sea, the stone was placed in the fledgling British Museum in 1802. Crowds quickly flocked to see it. Could this be the object that would finally allow people to crack the mysterious hieroglyphs? The challenge ahead was a huge one, but so were the potential rewards, and many would pick up the gauntlet. So it was immediately a very exciting object. So as I mentioned, um, it was realized that it could be the key to decipherment. So immediately the French took copies of the Rosetta Stone and sent them across Europe. In many countries, uh, in the world actually, scholars started to work simultaneously on the Rosetta Stone and gradually we have Jean-Francois Champollion and Thomas Young from England um, leading that race. Thomas Young was a British polymath a master of many academic trades, and the last man who knew everything, according to his biographer. Jean-Francois Champollion, based the other side of the English Channel in France, was an expert linguist. These two figures would be the titans of the great race to decipher hieroglyphs, a race which began with the Rosetta Stone. They started with the royal names, the names of the pharaoh, which is uh, written in this elongated oh, uh, yes. oval. That cartouche that there you is see it, that, that is, yes. yes, so that's the name of the king Ptolemy, Ptolemy V. And the ancient Egyptians wrote foreign names phonetically, which means one sound, one letter, in, in a way alphabetically. So the scholars could start with those letters and create a kind of alphabet of um, about 20, 26 letters that could then be used to read uh, other parts of the text. And so in the whole race to decipher hieroglyphs, how significant is this particular object, is the Rosetta Stone? Well, it's, it's extremely significant because it accelerated the race. Um, it finally gave the scholars the bilingual text that they needed. Already towards the end of the 17th century, many scholars said if only we had a longer bilingual text in a language that was known, we could then understand at least the content of, of hieroglyphs. So because we have the Greek, we can understand at least the content of the text. Um, the difficulty was that uh, Greek is an alphabetic language and ancient Egyptian is not. It has alphabetic letters, but it also has many more. Uh, signs, uh, many more hieroglyphs that cannot be read alphabetic. And it's, it's a mixed hybrid system. And it took 22 years for scholars to really understand uh, that. Of course, the scholars used a lot of other objects, which are on show, uh, some of them are on show in the exhibition. But the Rosetta Stone really was, was the starting point of everything. Once the Rosetta Stone was discovered and copies of its bilingual inscription were shared across Europe, the great race to decipher hieroglyphs was on. So Alona, the Rosetta Stone, that's the starting gun and the race to decipherment is on. And we have this incredible object right in front of us here. What exactly is this? It's a part of a long papyrus. It's a book of breathing, as we now know. So it's one of the guides to the afterlife. Champollion, of course, didn't know that at the time. He studies this papyrus because he wants to look at other objects in addition to the Rosetta Stone. He finds the Rosetta Stone very difficult. He says to his brother, I cannot make sense of any of it, so I'm going to try to look at other objects. And this papyrus was brought to Paris by Vivant de Nord, who's one of the scholars who had joined Napoleon's army. And what you can see is, in addition to some colorful uh, vignettes, is the text that, of course, was of prime importance to Champollion. 
And it's written in hieratic, which is also a handwritten version of hieroglyphs, but it's not demotic. Right. And so he made the mistake of comparing this text with the middle part of the Rosetta Stone, which of course also didn't work because they're basically two different scripts used for two very different purposes. At this point, hieratic was used for religious manuscripts, whereas demotic was used for day-to-day -day speech. So he couldn't really match the two. For Champollion, the lack of progress he made with this object was gut-wrenching. Unable to make sense of either this papyrus or the Rosetta Stone, the great scholar rapidly started to lose hope. How does this affect Champollion? He was devastated in a way. Um, he writes to his brother that he wants to give up. He's not going to bother with hieroglyphs or demotic anymore. He wants to learn Coptic, which is the later phase of Egyptian language, but written in, a, in an alphabetic script. And at the time, Coptic was still spoken and was still used in the Coptic church. And he becomes friends with Coptic monks in Paris. And so he says, here we have the language still living. So if I learn Coptic, I will at least have the vocabulary to understand perhaps the words that are behind uh, the hieroglyphs. So that's the next step, as it were. It is, yes. And this will allow him to uh, understand the older manuscripts, which were yes, written yes. Arabic uh, Coptic, because he was already fluent in Arabic. So he had access to certain manuscripts that most of the scholars before him didn't have. Champollion's decision to learn Coptic would ultimately give him the edge in the great decipherment race against the likes of Thomas Young. But one object that he had very limited access to was the Rosetta Stone itself. With the Napoleonic Wars raging in the early 1810s, British and French relations were at a dismal low. But nevertheless, cross-channel communication between the likes of Young and Champollion continued, evidenced through an extraordinary letter. Now, Alona, this is absolutely incredible. Here you've got correspondence between these two titans of the decipherment race. Yes, so Champollion actually never saw the real Rosetta Stone, we think, and he's working from copies um, that were circulating in, in Paris. And he complains quite a lot about the quality of those copies. And at a certain point in 1814, he writes to the Royal Society and he asks for a new copy of the Rosetta Stone. The letter is passed on to Thomas Young, who is the secretary of the Royal Society. Champollion didn't know that at the time, but Thomas Young receives the letter and tries to answer as, as good as possible. And he drafts his answer on the same letter that Champollion sent him. How interesting. So that's Young. So that's Champollion's original letter there. I can see words like Rosette there, Alona, and also qui mm -hmm. uh, le plus des difficultés. I'm guessing that's emphasizing that he's having difficulties at the moment with yes. his copies of the Rosetta Stone. Yes, so he's again uh, not sure whether his copies are accurate enough, whether they are uh, good enough that he's, that he's reading the text well. So he's saying that he has two copies. One is um, a facsimile um, that was part of an engraving and the other one was actually the uh, engraving um, that later appears in the Description de l'Egypte. So that engraving of the Rosetta Stone was already circulating before the Description de l'Egypte was published. And he asks specifically in this letter yeah, to, to check a few words um, because perhaps they are not very clear in the, in the copy that he's working with. And so how does Young respond to this letter? This is a draft of a letter that was eventually sent, which we don't have anymore. That's why this is so valuable to have this draft. And also uh, you can see that Thomas Young writes a few of the words that Champollion is asking for in the motic, in the draft. So he is checking um, the words that Champollion is asking for. And um, yeah, this is um, a, a kind of friendly correspondence uh, between the two. Because so often we associate Champollion and Young as being these great rivals in this hieroglyph mm. race, but here they're helping each other out with the Rosetta Stone. Yes, so it will take a few years before Champollion really gets a new copy of the Rosetta Stone, but at least he tries to help at this point in 1814. We're still early in the race. Later they get into contact more often and um, there is a bit of tension between them later on. But at this early point in time, not yet. And Alona, what's also so interesting is that letter there, it's dated to 1814. This is before Waterloo, still the time of the Napoleonic mm -hmm. Wars. Yeah. And still you have this correspondence between 
the British and the French in academic circles? Yes, this was the case from, from the very beginning when the Rosetta Stone was discovered, um, when France and Britain were not in on the best terms. But on a scholarly level, um, yeah, scholars were communicating with each other and regardless of political developments, that's also why this is really beautiful, is that there's always so many different parts to the story. It's fascinating to see firsthand friendly correspondence written by Young and Champollion more than 200 years ago as the Napoleonic Wars raged, bringing you so much closer to the geniuses themselves. Over the following eight years, both Young and Champollion would strive to crack the hieroglyphic code. Slowly but surely, more information came to light. Copies of more inscriptions were shared, papers were published, breakthroughs were made, on the Rosetta Stone, Thomas Young correctly presumed that each symbol within the cartouche of King Ptolemy had a phonetic value. Basically, that each symbol had a different sound. But Young didn't quite translate the correct sound value for each of the symbols. The spotlight thus turned to a reinvigorated Champollion, who, taking advantage of his newfound understanding of Coptic, worked tirelessly to put in place the final pieces of this great linguistic puzzle. Finally, on the 14th of September, 1822, Champollion cracked the hieroglyphic code. He got up from his desk, ran down the corridor, according to the story, and burst into his brother's office, shouting, Je tiens le fer, look, I've got it. And then he fainted. When he came round a little while later, he published this, the letter a Monsieur Dacquier. Champollion had done it. He had finally deciphered the ancient Egyptian language, controversially opting not to acknowledge Thomas Young and his work in the letter. Champollion took the glory. He had made the ultimate breakthrough. He would be remembered as the man who deciphered hieroglyphs. And this great quest to crack the code had all started just over 20 years earlier with the discovery of the Rosetta Stone. Or had it? Now, Ilona, it's important to highlight, isn't it? Although the Rosetta Stone is incredibly significant, that's not year zero in the decipherment story, is it? There are people who are fascinating in deciphering this ancient language for centuries before the stone. Well, it starts in Egypt itself uh, in the first place, of course, because Egyptians and, and other Arab travelers in the medieval period who went to Egypt were intrigued and inspired by the hieroglyphs they saw on temple walls and on the walls of tombs and on objects that were just standing around and they tried to give their own interpretations uh, to hieroglyphs. They started to uh, decipher themselves, they started to identify uh, individual signs as you can see uh, yes. in some of the manuscripts. So actually Ilona, looking at all of these objects, the story of deciphering hieroglyphs is not just 20 years long, it's more than a thousand years long. Yes, in a way, this is true. Um, it started already, of course, in Egypt itself, and um, Arab medieval scholars and, and Coptic monks also made huge contributions um, on which later scholars will build. And one of the very important uh, contributions is that they acknowledged that Coptic contained the remnants of ancient Egyptians. And as Arabic becomes more widespread in Egypt, um, these Coptic monks feel, are afraid that they're losing their language and they start to copy manuscripts from Arabic into Coptic and thereby preserving some of the knowledge um, of, of these texts. And we can see a papyrus here that is one of the few examples we still have. It's on loan from the Bodleian Library. And it's one of those um, magical Arabic m manuscript translated into, into Coptic. One of the uh, very important contributions of the Arab scholars is that they made that connection between ancient Egyptian and Coptic. It's, it's the Arab medieval scholars who were the first to acknowledge that and to say that. The 14th of September 1822 was the day that Champollion made the ultimate breakthrough. But this was only part of a much larger story that spanned centuries. A story that stretched back before the discovery of the Rosetta Stone with the work of these Arab scholars, and one that continued after Champollion cracked the code, as he and his contemporaries reacted to the breakthrough and began to unravel the enigmatic world of ancient Egypt. 200 years on from Je tiens le fer, the British Museum's new exhibition is shining more light on the people and objects behind this seismic breakthrough. 
how the decoding of these small symbols opened up the wondrous world of ancient Egypt to us all. Thanks for watching this video on the History Hit YouTube channel. You can subscribe right here to make sure you don't miss any of our great films that are coming out. Or if you are a true history fan, check out our special dedicated history channel, historyhit.tv. You're going to love it.